Now then, crew. Hayes Engineering. That's where we are at Ken. We met in the village a little bit earlier on. Said to yourself, Andy, go down to Hayes Engineering. Have a look round. It's a fantastic place. So, here we are. Got the brochure. No idea what's in there. I think it gives us a bit of a map. Let's have a look. Oh, yes. There we go. Look. So, we've got a map. But uh, they told me when I got here that I'm absolutely perfect timing because Ken, the same guy that we met at the side of the road that we had a long talk to, is doing an actual presentation in the workshop behind me and we're going to see the machinery actually up and running. How cool is that? I mean, we couldn't have timed it any better. Anyway, I've got 11 minutes before it all starts, so I'll have a quick wander around. I spot Ken. He's going to walk right directly behind me. There he is, look. <laughs> right, very shortly we'll be entering the Hayes Engineering Workshop, famous in this area. One of the very first engineering workshops set up and responsible for an awful lot of very cool stuff. Not just in this area, but further afield as well. But Ken will tell us all about that. A little bit of history for a start. The Hayes family came here from Warwickshire in England in the late 1800s. They came here as millwrights. And the first thing they made commercially was the pollard cutter for cutting pollard to poison the rabbits. And pollard is a bran mixture. You lay it out like pastry on a tray, run the pollard cutter one way, then the other. That cuts it into cubes, and they would feed the rabbits initially. When they got them onto the feed, they then mixed up the pollard with the phosphorus. And that was the early poison. So these pollard cutters were not selling very well. So Mrs. Hayes left her oldest daughter in charge of the younger children. How old are you, mate? Eight. Eight. She was 12 when Mrs. Hayes left her in charge of the younger children while she climbed on her bike and traveled the whole of the Maniatoto, Vincent, and Mackenzie counties on her bike with a sample of pollard cutter. So she would have been one of her first traveling salesmen. <laughs> she didn't do it for long, but she did do it. They then went into the different models of wire strainer. The first one in 1906 was, had the same back grip on this end as that. Then in 1911, they changed that back grip. In 1916, they improved it and made it a bit wider like that one there. In 1922, they went to the chain grab wire strainer. And then the main change in 1924 was they put a swivel on the chain. And that 1924 model got a 1981 design award. It took that long for the powers that be to recognise the significance of it. So they're still made today in exactly the same manner. Now, they made a multitude of other things, a lot of them fencing related, but of course some of them not. And uh, you know we can get a bit of snow here in the winter, so you put these clamps around the solid rubber tyre, wooden spoke rim, put a bolt through the top, put three or four of those around the wheel, and that gets you around in the snow. And that's the wooden pattern that this yeah. piece was cast from. So it's wow. pretty special to still have the wooden patterns here, and we'll see a multitude more of those as we go through. Now, you're all familiar with the flat standards and the fences, just like it's behind the museum here that keep the wires the right spacing. The odd one will break, and they always break at a hole. So you drop that down over the broken piece, put the wire back in, drop the other broken piece down on top, drop the pin down the edge to wedge it in place, and you've effectively got your broken standard repaired without having to cut all the wires to put a new one in. And you can't have it, Jim, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Any ideas what that's for? No, you should know, Jim. Nothing to do with fencing. No. When the blade shears come out of the box, the tips will cross. So you put that on, screw it down, and that pulls them back at that point so the tips don't cross, and you get a bigger uh, bite of your fleece. So the blade shears still use these today mm -hmm. to set their shears. As I said, uh, yeah, and Hannah went out on her bike and travelled the area on her bike. The last time she went out, she was coming home over Blacks Hill down the valley here. And of course all the roads were gravel then. 
and uh, she came off her bike coming down this side and was a bit the worse for wear when she got back in. So she said to the boys, look that's it, I'm not going to go out. So the boys went out and uh, they went on motorbikes and travelled the whole of the North Island as well as the <laughs> South. And Doug Smith, who was married to Olive, must have pushed the bike a bit hard coming home this one day and he blew the piston in it. So he limped it in here. Blue <laughs> said to him, will you get away home see Sister Olive and I'll see what I can do with it overnight. So, thanks Graham. He turned that piston down out of a pipe cap. You can still see the thread on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. Drilled out a couple of bolts for the gudgeon gotcha. pins. Fantastic. Turned down the grooves for the rings. Put the rings in, put it back together and said to Doug the next morning what he'd done. And just to go easy on it, by the time he came back, he would have a new piston to put back on. So it's pretty special yeah. to still have that here. Now, have you been to the Hay store in Invercargill? Yeah. Well, Irving Hayes was the travelling salesman for here, and it was Irving and Norman that started that store in Invercargill. And Norman gave Bert Munro a colossal amount of assistance in the building and production of the fastest Indian motorbike. And even today, you can go to that store and you will see the original Fast Indian on display. But I'd venture to suggest that that fastest Indian may not have happened had it not been for Norman's help and influence. So that relationship was pretty special and it was really recognised just about three weeks before Norman died when they had a special screening of the fastest Indian movie for Norman and his family. So that relationship was pretty special. Mm. Nice. So with that folk, we'll move on through to the works. So originally the works was powered with a windmill. That windmill was 21 and a half feet in diameter, six and a half metres for our younger ones that are not quite so conversant with the old imperial measurements. It was the largest conventional type windmill in the country at that stage. Ernest Hayes took the windmill down in 1927 because it was too inefficient and put the Pelton wheel in, which still stands there today. Though we're not running off the Pelton wheel now, we're running off electric motor. Above the Pelton wheel is a generator. That generator is 230 volt, 10 kVA DC. Now being DC power as opposed to the AC we have today was really only for lighting, both here in the works, the house further down behind our place, the big house and the Hayes homestead was always referred to in the community as the big house. And also uh, power for lighting for the manager's residence further up above the flower mill. When I say that power was only for lighting, as you go through the homestead, in the kitchen you will see an old Moffat range. That range was installed in 1937. So until recently when we got heavily into the restoration process on the homestead and had to shift that range back to its original position and disconnect it from the national grid power, it was still going. Now you wouldn't get a range to last that long today. <laughs> no chance. You can see from the layout of the shafting, the original shafting only came to about pulley number 11. Then they extended out this workshop and then after that put the right angle drive in out the corrugated ironwork. So they've really extended the shafting as the need has arisen. Hayes are probably best known for their wire strainers and their windmills. They, and most of those uh, were made from, from castings and the wooden patterns. They didn't uh, do any casting here, not to any extent, but they made all the wooden patterns here. And they used to turn them out on the wood lathe in the corner. That was originally treadle operated. And when they put the shafting in, they converted it to belt drive. And you can still see the treadle underneath there against the back wall. Does anyone do any wood turning at all? Yeah? Have, have you ever used old files as a turning tool? No, the old files make a very good turning tool. You re-temper them, sharpen them up, and they hold their edge very well. I wouldn't advocate using the new ones of today because you'll find they won't be as consistent their hardness. But that is still pretty much sharp enough to shave with. We didn't get the National Grid power here until 1955. And until then, people used to bring their batteries here to be charged. Mm -hmm. The resistors, as they're set up, take the power down from 230 volts down to 12 volts. Put the other one back in the middle, it takes it down to 6 volts, which is what all the batteries were. We have the guards so you don't put your head into the resistors, but you might have heard them get a little brisk here in the winter, and it's a great spot to take the edge off the hands. <laughs> that 
this typical of us here in Central, there's just a little bit of rust on the exposed side, and the other side is still pretty much as clean as it ever was. And that's a wire strainer handle that's been here since prior to 1952. But it's been miscast, and all I can see they've done wrong with it is that cast that piece there just a little bit small to be able to cut a thread in to screw up the inside of a half inch pipe. Mm -hmm. And that's what they still use for a wire strainer handle today, is half inch pipe. The business was really booming when they moved to Christchurch. And they only moved because of the rising cost of importing the raw material and shipping out the finished products. So before they moved to Christchurch, this punch and shear machine ran off that pulley and it ran too slow. So they wrapped a rope around the pulley to make it bigger to speed it up and it ran like that for 40 years. <laughs> you know, if it ain't broke, why fix it? <laughs> so the hacksaw and the drill and the lathe will come back and see them going here in a month or two. Now, you're yeah, a fairly bright sort of a bunch. You've got to be to be here with us on a Sunday afternoon when we should all be in church. <laughs> what do you reckon that's for? Shoveling, Shoveling stuff. stuff. No. Oh, bricks. No. 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 It's a mold No. It's angled for a reason. Yeah. So the fuel all used to come in a four gallon tin that was sealed. You would drive that down the corner, that spike would pierce the tin, and you'd pour your petrol into your car, your kerosene into your tractor. <laughs> and on the back here is a little clip, and that had a short chain on it. And that was made to hook up under the seat of a Model T. Because the Model Ts were always a big of a thing to get petrol into. So there you go. Brilliant. <laughs> now, have any of you done any ice skating at all? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Spend a bit of time in your behind? Yeah. yeah. Should have brought your skates here, girl, because this is an ice skate shop. Oh. You lay your blade on the guide, I even run, it, those. run it through, and the size of the stone will put the hollow grind in, and that gives you two running surfaces. Mm -hmm. And of course, your figure skates are always hollow ground. Your speed skates and ice hockey skates are flat ground. Oh. But the figure skates were always hollow ground, and the sharper they are, the easier they are to skate on. So next time you go skating, Lassie, just have a look at the blades. <laughs> and if they're not sharp enough to cut your finger on the edge, give them back and tell them I'll have a sharp pair, please. Then they'll think you're a real expert. And of course, you know that... <laughs> You know, the well, we know it all. <laughs> you, you know the definition of an expert. The X is the unknown factor and the spirit is no more than a drip under pressure. <laughs> so there you go. The interesting thing about the grinders is the dust extraction system. There's a big blower up in the rafters that creates the suction. Take all the dust and grip down through the downpipe here into the flue. Same here, down through here into the flue. Took it up and blew it out over the roof. And then there's another pipe running along the peak of the roof there down to take the shavings away from the lathe here. So everything's very clean to operate. Gosh. Now, no one's mentioned OSH yet, Occupational Health and Safety. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry about that. Yeah. Why, why would we do that? If they don't well, see it, didn't happen. Well, the Labor Department came through in 1966, and that's the only guard they wanted. Was that three to one? <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Things have changed a little bit now. We'll come back to that a bit later. Eh? Fantastic. Come on through, folks. The drill was bought out of an exhibition in Christchurch in 1906. The pulleys are wooden, the main drive belt is leather, the bearings are hardwood. Now those bearings are lignum vitae, which is a hardwood that came out of South America, and it's very hard, but it's very sympathetic to the shafts, and doesn't wear the shafts like brass or white metal bearing will. So far as we know, those bearings are original. Now they use that same material for making the bearings on the ship propellers, the bearings on the turbines and the powerhouses, the early lawn bowls, and I understand the Spitfire propellers were made from lignum vitae. So it was quite a widely used material. Useless information? Do you want useless information today? No, I love it. <laughs> Interesting information. Okay. I understand that Southern Rata has the same properties as lignum vitae. Okay. Tend to be correct on that. The interesting thing about the drill is the clamp they've made up to drill down the centre of a shaft. And all it is is a piece of angle line with a wedge block behind. So you put your shaft in, put your bit in, you slide on there, pivot on there, 
to get your bit dead centre, when you've got it dead centre, tighten it down and you can drill down the centre of your shaft. Now this is in the original stone area, so this was long before they had the lathe. Nowadays, you just do that sort of job in a lathe. Yeah. So this made a difficult job very easy. Now, the anvil is interesting. Got no ring to it. Yeah. The reason it's got no ring is they broke it. And they <laughs> broke it through the middle here. And haze being haze, they didn't throw it out. They drilled a couple of holes up the centre, put a thread in there, and faulted it back together. <laughs> now, they drilled those holes with a chain brace. Oh. That's the chain brace they drilled the holes with. Yeah. So you put your bit and put the chain around the material you're going to drill. And as you wind the handle, it tightens up on the thread and pulls the bit into the material you're drilling. So I'm guessing it was the apprentice <laughs> that, that probably got the job of drilling the holes. That's he probably finished while. his apprenticeship about the time they got the thread yeah. on here, but he's done it under great direction because there's not even a wrench there. It's absolutely perfect. Now, as you go over to the homestead, the gateway you'll go through at the back there behind the windmill, you may notice that the hinges on those gates are round. Now they used to make quite a few wooden gates, they made all the hinges and gudgeons and gate catches and everything that went with them, but as I say they made the hinges out of round material and they would heat up those hinges in the forge, lay them on here and a gentle tap on top and that would put a knurl on the hinge. The hinge was then mounted to the gate with a couple of U-bolts. So if you wanted to adjust the angle of your gate, you loosen off the U-bolts, slip the hinge through, when you had it at the right angle, tighten up the U-bolts, and you had your gate adjusted. Yeah. Now, isn't that easier than the flat hinges you buy today? Because mm -hmm. if you want to adjust them, you've got to drill new holes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they were well ahead with their thinking. There were eight people worked here when the work was at its peak. When everyone was at the station ready to start work, you come in. Well, were you ready? <laughs> Not 100%, no. So that warned everyone the shafting was going to start. And then you push on that lever. That takes the main drive belt off the idler outside and onto the drive and throws your shafting into gear. Yeah. And then you adjust that wheel. And that wheel is hooked up to a deflection flap on the Pelton wheel to deflect the water either right into the cups or slightly away to keep the voltage under 230 volts. And that's all there is to it. Now, as I said, they were pretty good thinkers. They had another couple of wires that ran from that deflection flap across the laundry of the homestead. So as you go through the homestead and go through the kitchen into the laundry at the back, you will notice a handle on the wall, a bit like a bike pedal with a cog and chain on it, and a couple of pipes poked through the sun-dried brick wall high up in the wall. And uh, the wires went through those pipes and hooked onto either end of the chain. So at night when it was bedtime, Mrs Hayes would go through to the laundry and wind on the handle. Mm -hmm. That pulled the deflection flat down so the pelt wheel stopped. So the generator stopped, so the lights went out, so we went to bed. <laughs> Come breakfast time in the morning, she'd reverse the procedure and you had a bit of light to have a shave by. You missed Andy. I did actually, and there's yeah. There's a fellow over here, I only got part way through there, must, must have turned the power off again. Yeah. Yeah. So you see fellas, the ladies had the final say even then. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time I've heard that one, Jim. Thank you. Do <laughs> remember that one, Graham? <laughs> Come on around the corner, folk. Hey, this machine is a hoop bender. You adjust the rollers, whatever size hoop you want, feed your iron through, and you leave the hoop like what's hanging in the hook up there. And that's what they used to mount the sails for a windmill on. And those windmills that are up the driveway, the hoops on those, the sails are mounted on, would have been turned in this. <laughs> but you will notice the windmill in the complex there, that the sails on it are mounted on flat iron. And that was the first windmill they made and sold commercially. And that was sold to Bill Beck next door. And windmill no longer needed it, he gave it back to us. So eventually, when I work in through the, uh, the, the, the bureaucratic enterprise, I'll call it, uh, I'm going to have a prospect cover 
underneath that windmill so you can see down into the well. Which is about 10 or 12 feet deep and it's all lined with round stone. Mm -hmm. Beautifully done, really. Mm -hmm. Just beautiful. So the triplex or permanent wire strainer that was mounted permanently on the fence, mm -hmm. the reels were cast out, and I've got no worries about anyone walking away with that one because it's been miscast. It's a bit mm -hmm. cock off. <laughs> but the sides were made here. And they would punch the holes in the punch and shear machine, then put them in there, and that knocked them into the shape they wanted. And that was something that Clive Hayes and Doug Smith engineered after the Hayes moved to Christchurch. Before that, they used to bend these by hand. So can you imagine walking in to three or four thousand of those to bend by hand? I think you talked to the apprentice again, didn't you? Mm -hmm. But he might be still putting the thread in that hand. <laughs> Very strong, though. So there you go. So that was something they made up out of an old Delco ready lighting plant. And in the back is an Essex gearbox to regulate the speed. Mm. Now, the spinning jetties. Anyone familiar with this one? So you're familiar with this one. Did you realise it had a brake on it? They're usually over random. No, 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 no. They've got a brake on them. Have they? Yeah. You didn't read the instructions, mate. <laughs> <laughs> See the saddle over the shaft here? Yep. There's a wing nut underneath. You adjust that wing nut and that puts enough pressure on the star shaft to give you your braking ability. A bit of friction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Now this is a very early one. This is the, the, the uh, full scale size of that model I showed you when we went through the mm. introduction. Mm. And it's better than a lot of the spinning jennies you buy today because it's got a brake on the top. So you adjust the handles to put enough pressure on the spring. So if you're pulling wire into a fence and stopping to go through postal standards, when you stop, the genie will stop, and it doesn't overrun. And you don't end up with a flaming bird's nest. Yep. And everybody that's dealt with high tensile wire knows what a bird's nest is, don't you? So you can still buy a hay spinning genie today with a brake on it, and it is exactly the same as that. <laughs> but you must buy the deluxe model to get the brake. The standard model doesn't have the brake on it. So there you go. Yeah. This one's pretty special. If you look at the name plate on the bottom of this, you can see Hayes and Sons Soul Makers Rough Ridge Otago, New Zealand. Rough Ridge changed to Oturi Hua in 1908. So that's over 100 years old. Wild wonder, is it? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. 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 This was found at uh, Anderson's just down the road. Down the road, old yeah. yeah. When uh, uh, my next door neighbour was down there giving me a hand to clean up, he was working there at the time, and they were going to chuck that in the dump. And he said, oh, I think I know where that should go. So we did. <laughs> now, that spinning, uh, that wire strainer handle I showed you through the other side of the rust on it, they used to put a die on here, and you would pull the die down onto the wire strainer handle to put the thread on it. When it reached the end of its stroke, you put your foot on the pedal, and that puts the die into reverse and spun it back off. And that's a simple forward reverse, like the fishing boats had the same caps and drive system. The early ride on lawnmowers had the same forward reverse. It's very simple, but very effective. Now, the wooden patterns are beautifully made. So that's the opposing parts to the clutch on the line side. The significance of the brown is the brown part would be a hole. So the foundry knew, when this pattern came in, that that brown part was to be a hole. So it was Lou Hayes, Les's dad, who did all the pattern making. He would send these patterns to the foundry. The foundry takes a sand mould from the wooden pattern, and then they pour the casting into the sand mould. So the wooden patterns had to be dead right. But, you know, just beautifully done. And if you look at this one, that's the wooden pattern for a drive cog for a dray wheel, and this is cast equivalent down there. Now if you look closely at this, you can see it's made out of three narrow strips of timber, and all the joins are staggered all the way around. You know, it's just beautifully done. So all of these boxes here are full of wooden patterns. Heritage New Zealand has recently done an accession register in here, and they accessioned three and a half thousand items in this room. Now, eventually, you will be able to go into the 
into your computer, into the Heritage New Zealand website, access Hayes, and if you're looking for the wooden pattern for an eight foot new idea windmill, you'll find them listed as being on the fourth shelf in the south wall in the corrugated <laughs> iron wing. <laughs> I understand it's still a work in progress at this stage. <laughs> That's a brand spanking new windmill pump. That one's never been used. You can still buy the leather washers for these from McNeil Drilling in Alexandra or E. Hazen in Vicargo. They're still available. They're still in use today. Now, as I said, you're a fairly bright sort of a bunch. You've got to be here, you need to be here with us on a Sunday afternoon. What do you reckon that's for, apart from another use for an Andrews liver salt tip? <laughs> right. That's interesting. Right. Um, that seems like a little... You know, it's got sort of painting with a lid on it. Yeah, yeah. Take the lid off of a, a painting. Yeah, no, it's not for painting. No, no. no. Take the lids off. Yeah, you can take the lid off. Yeah, you have to take the lid off for its use. Yeah. No, I can see the rust falling out of your ears. You're thinking, and that's very good yeah. for the grey matter. What's that? Sorry. Sowing seeds. That's dead right. You've been here before. No. <laughs> <laughs> he's the, he's got ability to think outside the square. This boy. That's exactly what it's for. You adjust the slide to whatever size garden seed you've got, and you can go out and plant your garden, just like that. That's fantastic. So there you go. You can put Mr. Wattie's out of business. <laughs> These wooden frames with the iron inserts are sun-dried brick, brick moulds. That's what they used to make the sun-dried bricks in. And if, as I said, they didn't waste anything. If you look at the end of this one, you can see the remnants of plume oil there. That was made out of a four-gallon tank. But the sun-dried bricks are a mixture of mud, cow manure and tussock. The cow manure does the waterproofing and the tussock is the reinforcing. So we still use that same brew for our maintenance today. And we've got our local uh, plasterer from Ranfurly, Ross Miller, who has transformed himself from working with cement and, and blocks and bricks to working with sun-dried brick very, very well. And he does all of our maintenance work here. We knew pretty much what the recipe for the for the work was, what the mixture was, but we thought they must have it written down somewhere. And we hunted and hunted and hunted through all the records looking for the for what the recipe would be. Finally found it. Where else? But the recipe book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where else would you get the recipe? Now the grease was imported in 1910 for the horse-drawn ploughs. Have a smell of it. It's a tallow-based grease. I've never bumped anyone intentionally on the nose yet. It's quite different. I had a lassie here who was familiar with the smell a year or two. You know, you get up close, you're right. Go for it, bud. <laughs> so I had a lassie from Fife House here a couple of years ago who was familiar with the smell because Fife House is built on whalebone foundation and it would be a whale tallow that they've used. So that was imported in 1910. The other barrel has never been opened. So that's been here over 100 years. Now, the off cuts from the fencing standard through the punch and shear machine, they would cut a square hole in the middle and that gives you a washer you can use on coach bolts, around sheep yards, cattle yards, that sort of application. Yeah. 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 yeah, we still use those today. And coach bolts are still cheaper to buy than engineer's bolts. So I'd hate to buy them today. They'd be 10 or 15, they could be half a dollar each. If you look along the top of the shafting, you can see on the top of each bearing is an oil bottle. In the bottom of each oil bottle is one of these. The flat end of the pin sits up in the bottle, the other end sits down on the shaft, and within the timber is a brass insert. So the oil runs down between the pin and the brass insert, and that's the oiling system. So it's very simple, but it's very effective. So once everything's oiled up, it lasts sort of two to three weeks, and we've got to go back through and redo it again. What are you looking at? Ammunition Oh, the ammunition, they did have an agency for uh, ammunition and sold a lot of cock shotgun cartridges. They supplied shotgun cartridges to the gun clubs. They were very keen gun club shooters. And the gun club at uh, Ida Valley, and the, of course the one here at Turi Hua, they supplied all the ammunition for that as well. So yeah. yeah.
Okay, with that, folk, we'll move outside. Just watch your shins and your head as you come through. So, the original windmill used to stand another story further up, and all that remains of that original windmill is the sail that's hanging on the end of the concrete pelt mill around there. So that gives you some idea of the size of it. The pelt and wheels within the concrete surround, you all know the difference between a pelt wheel and a water wheel? No. Top and no. bottom. With a water wheel generally, the water comes in at the top and falls into the bucket. Okay. So the weight of the water is turning the wheel and you have half your buckets full all the time. With a pelt and wheel, the water comes in at the bottom under pressure and drives it by the pressure rather than the weight. So the water for that Pelton wheel comes from the point on top of the hill where you can see the flags there above the broom. Mm -hmm. The 60 feet of fall mm -hmm. between that point and the Pelton wheel which gives just on 30 pound pressure for Pelton wheel. And that's enough to run the whole show. Now, have any of you been to St. Bathans? Yep. Seen the blue lake at St. Bathans? Yep. And have you been into the pub and looked at the photograph on the wall in the pub of the top structure that provided the pressure for the sluicing of the Blue Lake. There's a very, very good photograph in there in the pub and also in the hall of that drop structure and it's 200 feet. So they had a hundred pound pressure at the sluice nozzle. Jeez. And they started mining there in the 1860s and mined through until the 1930s. So they used to get all their iron and their steel in a rough state and they would throw it in here and leave it in here for two or three days just working against itself. That would take off any sharp points and rough edges. Then they would throw in a couple of shovels of sawdust. That would soak up any rust or any moisture that was in there and your material would come out bright enough to paint. So that's a whole lot easier than wire brushes or sandpaper or angle grinders. Yes. But there's reason why it's outside. I could hear this going at home half a mile across yeah. the paddock. <laughs> If you're making new standards, you would have your iron laid out here, set the stop to the length you want, you can shear it off, you can put your point on, if you're good enough you'll get the point dead centre, that's not bad for a boy on a Sunday is it? Because if your point's not dead centre then your fence line might not be straight. You're not. a hole through the middle. That gives you groove for your top barb on your fence. Then you get a hole underneath to be able to tie your barb on. And then if you've got enough, you catch the punch and every second down the strike. Just like that. Now, are you doing any fencing out there at the moment, Jim? Or are you, mate? There. No, not really. Not really. You didn't want a few standards for the multitude of options. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. So these standards are all made of iron. You can see the texture in there. They tried making a few standards out of steel laterally and they didn't last in the ground, they would rust out very readily, a bit like the Waratahs of today. You can't buy wrought iron new in New Zealand today. I understand there's still a foundry in Germany that is making some wrought iron for the blacksmiths and also one in India making some wrought iron for the blacksmiths. So there are millions of these still in use throughout the country and a lot of them are as good as the day they were put in. The pieces you punch out, if you've got a boy with a Shanghai, they're marvellous on windows or starlings, yep. or telephone pole cups, and you need a couple there, mate. <laughs> Have you got a Shanghai home? A slingshot? No, you ain't break something. There you go, take a couple of Good those. excuse to get one. <laughs> they're not too oily, I've washed most, wiped most of the oil off. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my dear. <laughs> I wasn't going to give you all of them, but that'll do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. You at least find a rake now. Don't you tell Mum where you got them yeah, from. Yeah, don't. So, 
the drill is interesting. We've got some larger bits if you want to drill some larger holes. No one's got any toothache today. No toothache. No, no. That's inch and 38 64th, that one. But the drill is interesting because it's two speed. That's on its slow speed. To put it onto its high speed, you let it stop, pull the pin out, take the wooden wedge from it and drop down onto its high speed. So it's very simple. Push the gear back up, wedge back in, pin back in, and you're back onto your slow speed. So very simple. You can see the right angle drive just done through a twist in the belt. Yeah. Yeah. Most people, if they wanted the right angle drive, would put a gearbox in, but Hayes just did it through the twist in the belt. That's the blower that provides the air for the board. The air comes in the side, goes up and over the top and down the back and into the board. So the blower itself is three speeds, three different pulleys there. And then you can adjust the airflow a little more on the wastegate at the back. So that's a whole lot easier than standing there working bellows all day long as you would have to otherwise. Oh, sure is. Mm -hmm. So the hacksaw is interesting, it's got an automatic shut off on it when it reaches the end of its stroke it'll automatically kick out of gear. Notice we've got a new blade in there, the old blade was worn out. So I went up to the local garage here and I said you haven't got a hacksaw blade in here and they gave me that. So I said it's too long, we're going to have to shorten it. There we go, we just get through. And they said, how are you going to shorten the hacksaw blade? Punch the shear machine. That shortened it and put the hole in as well. Works like a dream. And then we've got the drill, we've got the guard so you don't keep the fingers in the top. So you've got both hands to hang on to what you're drilling. You use the foot stirrup. <laughs> and most young fellas can use a pilot hole for a bit that size, but you don't need a pilot hole. All you need is a foot stirrup. There's all different methods of joining the belts. That's just stitched together. Then you've got your lace together joiner. And then you've got your adjustable joiner. And all that adjustable joiner is, is a couple of sides off a roller chain with a pin poke through either side. So it's very simple. <laughs> the lathe is four speed. Most of the machines are only three speed. But the lathe is four speed and it's still pretty accurate. <laughs> You will notice we've got the three-jaw self-centering chuck in there. If anyone would like to see the four-jaw chuck going, it's absolutely no trouble for Graham and I to whip these bearing caps off the top. If anyone wants to lift that three-jaw chuck out and lift the four-jaw one in. Not today. Right. That's about it for the works, folks. Uh, the clock is a bit unique. They must have run out of sevens the day they made it and they've used an upside down two. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Cheers, Ken. Thank you very much. So, there you go. Hayes Engineering and a huge thanks to Ken for doing all the hard work on this particular video. What a very, very knowledgeable chap and obviously he's been doing his research on the old Hayes engineering business because it, it, there's so much to take in, there really is. Um, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed this video. It's very different to what we normally do on the Andy Mechanic YouTube channel, but it has got 
you know, the history of engineering in central Otago, huge chunks of it, and is extremely valuable uh, for the people that live in this area. So if you're ever here in New Zealand, ever passing through Ida Valley, get yourself in and have a look around because it is super interesting. Even if you're not an engineer, it's the way it's presented, it is interesting. And, and Ken has told me that there's more projects in the line, uh, you know, further down the line for, for the future. So when you come down, there's, there's gonna be a lot more to see as well. There's a, some old well that he was on about, you know, he wants to put some perspex on that so you can see how the pump actually works and bring the water up from the well. Anyway, why not click on the subscribe button, uh, ring the bell, and then YouTube will send you a notification as and when I upload any new videos. You'll also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Feel free to communicate through any of those portals. My email address is down the bottom in the description, andymechanic at live.co.uk. Feel free to flick me an email through. If I have time, I guarantee I'll get back to you. I can't promise it, but if I have time, I will. I'm a busy chap these days. Now, if you'd like to support the channel, then you can do that in two different ways. One is through Patreon and become a patron, and that's a monthly donation, or you can do a one-off donation through that. Uh, or you can just use PayPal and just flick across a few dollars uh, through that portal. Uh, there's a, a link on the home page of the YouTube channel that you can click on. It'll take you through to, straight through to PayPal. Just do a donation. Okay, crew. Well, this is it from me for this particular video. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Cheers. Over and out. And we get the up again. Ha <laughs> ha